Are you guys ready for the dramatic conclusion of the book of Ruth? Let's jump right in. Welcome to Ruth Got Truth. Feel free to go back and read Ruth 1 through 3, and you can look at our Devo videos for that as well. But let me catch you up on where we are in the story very briefly. Boaz really wants to marry Ruth, but he's got some business to take care of first because as a Goel, a family redeemer, a kinsman redeemer, he's got to make sure he does this right. So what is the process? How does this man plan to marry this woman? Well, the romance plays out in court. Boaz went to the town gate and took a seat there. Just then, the family redeemer he had mentioned came by. So Boaz called out to him, Come over here and sit down, friend. I want to talk to you. So they sat down together. Then Boaz called ten leaders from the town and asked them to sit as witnesses. And Boaz said to the family redeemer, You know, Naomi, who came back from Moab, she is selling the land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should speak to you about it so that you can redeem it if you wish. If you want the land, then buy it here in the presence of these witnesses. But if you don't want it, let me know right away because I am next in line to redeem it after you. The man replied, all right, I'll redeem it. Then Boaz told him, of course, your purchase of the land from Naomi also requires that you marry Ruth, the Moabite widow, that she may have children who will carry on her husband's name and keep the land in the family. Uh, then I can't redeem it, the family redeemer replied, because this might endanger my own estate. You redeem the land, I cannot do it. Now in those days, it was the custom in Israel for anyone transferring a right of purchase to remove his sandal and hand it to the other party. This publicly validated the transaction. So the other family redeemer drew off his sandal as he said to Boaz, you buy the land. Then Boaz said to the elders and to the crowd standing around, you are witnesses that today I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. And with the land I have acquired Ruth the Moabite widow of Malon to be my wife. This way she can have a son to carry on the family name of her dead husband and to inherit the family property here in his hometown. You are all witnesses today. Then the elders and all the people standing in the gate replied, We are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, from whom all the nation of Israel descended. May you prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. And may the Lord give you descendants by this young woman who will be like those of our ancestor Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah. So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord, who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you and your old age, for he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast, and she cared for him as if he were her own. The neighbor women said, Now at last Naomi has a son again, and they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. This is the genealogical record of their ancestor Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Abinadab. Abinadab was the father of Nishan. Nishan was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. Guys, wasn't that a poetic ending to this narrative of Ruth? Remember how this started. Naomi and her husband had journeyed away during a famine to a place far away, a foreign country where they made their lives uh, and they had kids and then all of the men died. Remember Elimelech? This is the family connection between him and, and Boaz. This is the kinsman redemption opportunity that they face is, is it's Elimelech's family, broader family. And Kilion and Malon, these, these sons had married women and those men died too. And then you have this group of three women during a time which it would have been dangerous for them uh, not just to live but to, to travel. They were on the brink of oblivion, of disaster, of starvation. And they find out that God has blessed Naomi's home country with food, Bethlehem. So they journey to Bethlehem. Orpah uh, reasonably goes home uh, and, and Ruth is like, I'm with you. I'm with you, Naomi. 
I am I'm covenantly bound to you. And, and we're looking for God in the life of Naomi. And there, in this wonderful uh, widow who commits to her, her mother-in-law uh, beyond any expectations of their society, she says, I, I, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. We're going to see how that story, her promise, came true. She lived up to the promise she made. And God was there the whole time. So how are we to make sense of what happens, right? We, we know that, that Boaz and Ruth were kind of this developing romance. Boaz obeying the covenant of, of Yahweh, uh, living up to, to the gleaning laws and caring for the protection of this widow. And and then, you know, Naomi has this idea like, hey, go and, and um, you know, meet him in the threshing floor and put yourself in a vulnerable position where you're essentially proposing to this person and they know his character is good but what is he going to receive this foreign widow as his wife we're thrilled about this budding romance and and they the, the next morning boaz wakes up and he takes care of business and that's what unfolds in chapter four we spoke about the kinsman redeemer structure in episode three and we realized that that there's there's this interesting thing within Israelite culture, kind of a safety net, that somebody in the family system, cousins or something like that, can can redeem uh, the property so that, that that property carries on in the name. And, and there's even this idea of leveret marriage that shows up in places within the canon. And that'll, that'll we're going to look at a, a passage today that talks about this, the idea of, of, of uh, a brother or a cousin and their wife dies and they haven't had an heir yet. It's their, I know it sounds weird, it kind of sounds... Uh, you know, quasi Appalachian and as an Appalachian American myself, I can make fun of my own culture. Even my stepdad is my second cousin. It's a fact. When my dad died, my mom married his cousin. So my mom's not related to him or anything like that. This idea of a family taking care of its needs Boaz realizes that there's someone who's a closer relative and in this society this would have been significant. He has the first right to redeem the property that is there and uh, for him that might be a good investment because you get more land. Boaz knows all these details and he, and, and, and he, he goes to the gate and it's where all this business would have taken place and, and it so happened. It's kind of this providence, right? We're wondering where God is and all of a sudden this guy comes up and it's really interesting. The word that they use in Hebrew to describe this guy's name, did you? it says, hey friend in the NLT and it, it, that's, that's a pretty generous translation. It's more like What's his face? If you want to learn a little bit of Hebrew, it's Poloni Almoni. It literally means something like, uh, who's it? What's it? I'm going to translate and say, what's his face? Because it's fun to say. Now, why isn't this guy's name mentioned? Is it significant or is it not? So Boaz goes to the gate. And this is be a place where business took place in the ancient world he inhabited. Uh, there's a lot of things that happens at the gate. But if you were going to make a legal dealing, like a property transaction or even this, uh, you know, act of kinsman redemption, you would need witnesses. And in the Hebrew culture, you need 10. So Boaz goes right away, grabs 10 witnesses and some elders, and he sits down with this guy. What's his face, right? This guy doesn't even have a name. And in a, in a, a culture that's a bit preoccupied with telling the names, right? The, 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 this book closes with a list of names. Names are significant. Genealogies are significant. And for this man's name to be absent is a little bit intriguing. At least a little bit intriguing. Who is it? What's it? Uh, somebody, some, something? What is, what's his face up to? Boaz is doing all of this stuff. He's gathering the, uh, the elders. He's, he's, he's making sure that there's, there's witnesses involved. He is, uh, making sure that that this guy who's the closest of kin gets a fair chance at this. He he knows it would be uh, a lack of integrity if he somehow said, hey, uh, elders, I, I'm, I'm probably the, the closest. And if you notice, Boaz is concerned about the widows. And we'll get back to that in a moment. But what we see here is that Boaz is not trying to scandal his way into the situation he wants. He's being very frank. And there is a great deal of legal suspense here because you're like, Boaz, you're too good. Just take the woman and, and run away, elope with, with Ruth. And, and you know that's what Ruth wants. You know that's what Naomi wants. Why is he going to court to make sure that somebody else has a chance at her for first? Come on, Boaz, you're too good. He's gifted in legal procedure. 
hey, um, <clears throat> Poloni Almoni, what's his face? You know, there's there's land that, that you could claim. Do you, do you want to claim that land? Sweet. Yes. I'm going to redeem it. I'm, I'm such a good guy redeeming this this uh, this kinsman land. So in doing so, you also claim two widows, one of which is an old woman and one of which is a foreigner. Boaz is kind of withholding this. It's suspenseful and it's supposed to clear you. And you're like, Boaz, no, don't let him take Ruth. You're such a good guy. We don't trust anybody because this is the period of judges. Don't do it. When Boaz mentions the other obligations, something stirs in Poloni Almoni. I I don't think I can do it. It's gonna endanger my estate. So do you hear that? There's there is some self protection by this kinsman redeemer. And as we've seen so far, Ruth sacrificed her identity and her homeland to be with Naomi. She sacrificed her time and blood and sweat and tears in the fields providing for her food. Boaz sacrificed his, um, his own grain and barley and perhaps even his reputation as marrying a foreigner, which uh, might not have been looked positively on. And everybody's making sacrifices in this story, and it's a story of resurrection, a story of redemption. And here we meet the first person who hasn't made a sacrifice. He's not willing to make the sacrifice it needs to take care of the widows. Guys, let me just say, it costs something to, to love people. It costs something to provide for them, to care for them, to be available to them, to meet their needs. And the only man in the story that's not willing to sacrifice is the only man who is named Poloni Almoni. What's his face? So we get a glimpse into this custom that would have happened. And uh, I actually have a little kid's devo about uh, some of this implication of sandals. Sandals would have been used as a way of, of making real estate transaction. And here in this passage, we have him removing his sandal after walking away from this deal. And you can actually read more about some other implications that would bear on this interpretation of the sandal exchange or the lack of sandal. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, you find that a man who is not willing to redeem his relative's property and take care of his relative's uh, widows, his sandal is removed and he is shamed. And maybe that's the fate of Poloni Almoni. Maybe that's why we don't know what's his face's name. He's not willing to make the sacrifices and it appears that he must walk away ashamed. And so I love this about Hebrew culture that sacrifice is honored and an unwillingness to sacrifice is shamed. Guys, don't be Poloni Almoni and refuse to give of yourself and sacrifice for those in need. Boaz is upright. This isn't a Richard Nixon Watergate moment. Just because they're talking about sandals at the gate, the gate's the right place to do it and he's doing it all right. And he's even adding some trial suspense here. And guess what? His honesty and his forthrightness and, and his cleverness and his care to make sure that these two widows are taken care of is rewarded. And what results is a marriage. We've talked about this. It's kind of prefigured wedding of the, the cloak, the wing of the cloak going over Ruth. We talked about that last week. And now we have the fulfillment of this. He's made the legal transaction and the people bless uh, this new couple and, as if it was a wedding. And, and sure enough, that's what results. And they, they get married and we're, we're clapping. Like Ruth has worked so hard. She has trusted. She has uh, done so much. And Boaz has given of himself and been available and, and given so much himself. And you see when, when there's mutual sacrifice, there is fruit, there is growth, there is redemption, there is resurrection. So now we have an unlikely birth announcement, and this one's a little confusing, but it looks like Naomi's having a baby. Now, if any of you are following the story, you're like, wait a minute, isn't Ruth having the baby because her and Ruth and Boaz are a couple, and 
Imagine getting in your mailbox. You check your mail and you get this birth announcement and you look up, it's, it's, it's from Granny and, and you look at it and she's having a baby? Woo, granny's having a baby? Yes, they are having a baby. This is what Kinsman Redemption is about. Elimelech uh, got married and had sons and those sons died so there's nobody next in line. And now Ruth, it, almost as a substitutional sacrifice, is 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 uh, and Boaz as this this redemptive figure who's who's sacrificing himself to care for this has provided a replacement heir for the loss of Elimelech, for the loss of Melon, for Kilion. This dead line, this line that was on the brink of oblivion, uh, is now resurrected. It's Baby Yoda, and they have an heir. Hubbard, the guy I've been quoting commentary from. He suggests that Naomi will play a bit of a foster mother. Naomi cares for this son as if it were her own. And so, you know, whether it's like granny daycare or whatever, we have this ridiculous, crazy narrative, the impossibility of an old widow uh, all the way back in, in, a, in a foreign territory, now back in her hometown on her homeland, and the property has been redeemed, and there is a son. And so we see within the, the frameworking of mutual sacrifice, of covenant obedience, mediating and representing the presence of God, there is a narrative of resurrection and of unlikely pregnancy. That is the new birth and hope and the unlikely, amazing, surprising hope of, of our God. This is the way God acts, and we are so happy. And let's clap alongside Naomi. Right? This is a crazy narrative, and it's true, and it happened, and this is the way that God works in surprising and amazing and encouraging ways on, on a story that was set up uh, for the death and the failure and, and the, the, the suspense. It was just, it's going to be a sad story there's two widows just wandering around in the period of judges surely they're on to doom and it's turned into a story of the resurrection of her family all through the concept of covenant love of obeying god's way of life of of mediating his presence through our character of of the everyday things that they did that, 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 that was, was mutually building each other up and self-sacrifice created this opportunity for God to tell a good, good story. Your story matters. Your story is important. Your story, no matter how bleak your future looks like, it's grounds for God's character, for his way of life, for his resurrection hope to come into being. Do not count yourself out from being a key part of what God is doing in the world. He invites us into these narratives. And ultimately, for Ruth, in God's story, when you sacrifice, good things happen. And Ruth is said that she is better than seven sons. Hubbard here helps us understand what this means. The Israelite ideal number of sons. That's what seven sons is. However, Ruth had proved better than even the ideal. To say that one woman was worth seven men was the ultimate tribute, particularly in a story so absorbed with having a son. In the patriarchal, challenging climate of the period of Judges, we have here a redemptive arc in this wonderful role that this person does. Ruth is an inspirational figure because she, like us, is invited to play a role in God's story. It's so important. Let your reputation be built on your sacrifice, my fellow Christians. Remember, Ruth said, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. And we have this proof of how this works. That when we choose to stake our identity on this invisible and amazing and storied God, that we find ourselves in transit, that our citizenship changes. Let's read here from Hubbard as he talks about this. 
By implication, what had been up to now a private matter among Ruth, Boaz, and Naomi must receive public settlement. Only thereby can Ruth become a full-fledged Israelite and her initial commitment to Yahweh and his people be fully rewarded. And only thereby can she win complete acceptance as David's legitimate ancestor. Guys, faith is a visa for a new citizenship and Ruth is about this as well. So guys, do you see this? Do you see how a covenant with God changes who you are. It weaves you into a story. It weaves you into a people group that stretches beyond national boundaries. We are invited into the activity of the living God who turns the worst of situations and the opportunities for redemption we see here in this book. All through living out his love, obeying his law, and following through with the romance of, of following God and caring for one another, risking what we have to love one another. And we find ourselves transformed. Ruth the Moabitess is now the ancestor of David and thus the ancestor of Christ. So would you dare to be woven into this citizenship, to be woven into this story? It will take sacrifice. It will take commitment. It will take the development of your character. It will take covenant obedience. But what else is there when faced with oblivion? What other story is there worth telling? What other story is there worth being wrapped up into? Would you find your identity in the God that can turn fortunes? I believe God wants to do that in your life. I believe God wants to weave you into the story of redemption that we find in the book of Ruth. So, so guys, if, as we reflect on this book that strangely doesn't have a verbal form of God's activity, right? There's no direct action taken by God in this narrative. And yet, he's everywhere. Where is God in the book of Ruth? He was there in the famine and in the food. He was there in the journey away and the journey towards. He was there in the edges of the field and the center of the grain house and in the threshing floor. He was there at the gate and on the property that was redeemed. He was there in the character of Ruth and the commitment and her hard work. He was there in Naomi and her lament and her desire for wholeness. He was there in Boaz and his uh, obedience to God's covenant and his uh, generosity and proactivity. When you're looking for God in your life, would you see the contours of activity that he leaves all around us? That he indeed, with people who pay attention to him, is making himself known. And even more than that, he's not simply making himself known inviting you into that story that makes him known. Would you be woven into this incredible narrative of redemption and hope? One that, as we see, closes with a genealogy, points us in a trajectory towards Christ. You are part of this family too. This is your family tree. If you are making that migration of citizenship and faith, you too are are part of the kin that is redeemed and our kinsman redeemer, Christ. It's a great family to be a part of. And if you're not a part of it, I invite you to be. All right. I hope this has been an encouraging look at the book of Ruth. There's so much richness in all of scripture, and it's been fun to tarry with you through this romance. In the coming weeks, we're going to be talking about this big story and how it's important. And we're also going to be talking about our story as a church family, as a youth group over the last year, this disorienting season. And much like Ruth's story, my hope is to show you that in the, in the bleakest of starting points on our plot map and the uncertainty of our future, we have found a way to see the presence of God and the unfolding hope we have here among us in this family. So let's meditate on that together and let's be a part of this good, good story. 
I love you guys. Godspeed.